Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. So why don't we go around and introduce ourselves and tell everyone about a little bit about your business. So does anyone want to start? I'll go. I am the owner of Red, White, and Brew Coffee House, which we are planning on doing a reopen in Warwick, in Airport Plaza. In um, coming weeks, and my name is Michael. Hello, my name is Tracy Lee Allard. My business is called Thinking Diversity, which is a disability history, but also uh, disability rights kind of um, educational. I, I want to like I wanted to say like cultural, but it's it's educational cultural. Um, I started it for people who were recently diagnosed autistic, who didn't grow up. Um, with the same access as people who were early diagnosed so that we can teach them kind of the um, rules to these spaces that they might not know and like some of the safety things like what are things that are okay to talk about in these spaces and what are some that are or that will not be received well because not everybody knows that in terms of how to navigate disabled spaces. Thank you both of you for joining me today on this call for uh, this special episode for Development Disability Awareness Month, which is in March. So the first question I have for you both, and you can whoever wants to start can start, is um, reflecting on your journey, like back in your in your back in your previous years. Um, were there any challenges that you encountered, uh, especially during school? And how did um, did any of those challenges come along when you became a, an adult, or a young adult, as I say? I think, for me, a lot of mine was the stuff I didn't know. Not so much what I did. But um, I think navigating disability is, there's also a ton of, like, little... Um, surprise surprise packs that come like if you have autism then there's a, a few comorbidities that come with that like you'll probably have ADHD you'll probably have like some kind of anxiety that kind of thing um and I think navigating school I didn't realize that a lot of the stuff I was dealing with um wasn't just my autism but it was physical disability stuff that I didn't even know I had either um and I think that if I had known that, it would have been a lot easier and I would have gotten in a lot less trouble for what I needed to do. Because um, I was often put in a position as a kid to kind of make where I had to make medical decisions for myself that was like what I needed. Um, and I don't mean I don't mean like medical decisions like, oh, I'm going to put my shoulder back in place in the middle of math class, although I have done that before. Um, don't don't not good advice don't do that um but point is is that a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is like I would wear hats in school and they were like against the rules technically but I would do it so that I wouldn't like itch my scalp and I tried explaining that to the principal and everybody they were not going to accept that so I said okay um when they told me to take it off and they were going to make me take it off I took it off while I was nine side of them and then I put it right back on because it was what I medically needed. So like, I'm not going to argue with you um, even as a child for what I need. Even if you had a, a doctor's note saying that you need the, the hat or something, they I still wouldn't even, let you. I didn't even think of that. Like I didn't even know um, because I didn't know I had anything physical going on. Oh, okay. so I didn't really know that a lot of this stuff was all related to something physical. I found that out earlier this year um but if i had known i think that would have been great michael what about you did you have any challenges in your own school years uh i mainly just st struggled with like keeping focused and basically making friends and other things hmm. as as you um as you got older, did any of those challenges still stay or got better? Have you found like any tools or anything that you, you use to help you um, 
stay focused, stay on task, or make friends easily? The focusing got a little easier over the time. Making friends, same thing, a little easier. Employment has definitely helped. Yeah. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, only in your own business. Yep. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, because you, uh, well, when you own your own business, especially, especially for you, Mike, since you have a coffee shop, you interact with people in day to day, you meet, meet all new people, so you're up there, up front, and greeting people and taking their orders. So, yep. It also kind of puts you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So, there and try new things. I do love talking, though. It's, I mean, having it goes with the the job too. You have having a coffee shop, you have to be able to talk to people. But yeah, I didn't quite always like talking. Yeah, yeah, I me mean, neither. Yeah, I didn't like talking either when I was younger. Yeah, I was like the more I was the more quiet and shy kid. Yeah, I think when I got older, for me, and when I, as I started doing my podcast, I started talking more, and I. I, I I like to say is I found that the microphone is a tool for me to be social. Nice. Be around. So when I have a microphone or a camera, it's a way it kind of gets me out of that comfort zone and helps me be more social. Nice. I was on the opposite end of that. I was always too talkative, but I know why now like that. I realized that I use distraction as a way to deal with things. This is cookie, by the way, she's probably on and off. She's the CEO of my company, the proper CEO, the cat executive officer. Um, so anyway, uh, she'll be on and off. But the point is, is that I realized that like a lot of the things that I would do in terms of over talking was stuff that I would do to distract myself from other things, um, such as the struggles with making friends and like the way that I would emotionally feel about that. Um, it was kind of my way of like self-regulation and it backfired a lot of times because not everybody knew what I was doing and they're just like oh she talks a lot she's weird (laughs) um but you know it's something that like now that I know what's up I can kind of like tell people hey this is what I'm doing but yeah what aspect of your disability do you wish society better understood I think that like it's wild because a lot of stuff that's coming out with especially autism research. When I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed in in 05. I was diagnosed really, really young. So when I was diagnosed, they were just starting to kind of know what autism was. They were just starting to make movies about it. They were just starting to start talking about it. And so they were still behind on a lot of things. Um, And a lot of people, this is one of the things that, especially people who are joining the community now who are late diagnosed or self-diagnosed, don't usually realizes that a lot of that research that wasn't there for us either that they now have access to for themselves um a lot of that research came out in around 2018 um which is stuff about rejection sensitivity dysphoria stuff about like medical stuff that happens because of the stress of asd and all the different things that kind of go with it Um, yeah i noticed what you said that in all the years, there's a lot of information. It wasn't always easy access, but nowadays everyone has a computer in the pocket with 24-7 access to the internet. So it's much easier to get access. But on the downside is it's also easy to put out not the right information to. Yeah. Because if you yep. Google something or whatever search engine you use, you have to be careful because sometimes it may not be the right thing. And uh, a lot of people tend to believe that thing and not, and that's where we get, I just probably see on social media, get those conflicts. Yeah. That's what I'm struggling with too, like with my business and with getting it started is that a lot of people are turning to folks who do not have 20 years of experience advocating. They're, they're turning to people who do not understand that there are people in our community who cannot speak at all and who do need proxies who do need parents who do need staff to speak on their behalf um and a lot of people don't know the difference between a proxy and a disability mom or a disability dad or a disability parent um where they don't 
know how to look for people um, looking for the cues or however their loved one communicates, right? Because not everybody uses language in this community. There's body pitch, there's sign, there's a lot of different things. But some people know their family members' communication better than anybody else. What about you, Michael? What would you as society really not better understand? Yeah, I do actually wish people would be like slower uh, explaining stuff or just slower when talking to somebody um, who, yeah, so they don't get frustrated and everything. Mike, is that, is that similar to the comfortable language, um, plain language uh, model? Honestly, I don't know, Tracy. Um, basically, comfortable or plain language is that um, it's respecting folks who have a hard time dealing with a lot of like really complex information at once. So the whole premise of plain language and comfortable language is putting your language in as easy to understand wording and as clear wording as possible. So that slow would be a way to make it clearer so that people can process it and really take time conversations that we're having with people to really match their pace and their understanding. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, yeah, because not everyone um, learns at the same level. Uh, and uh, sometimes you have to break things down more or change the way we learn and um, use different um, different words or maybe symbols too, right? I, yeah. I, I see a lot more and more emojis and I, I kind of think it's funny because I think back of the caveman days when you, we used to do things with came stories and paintings because uh, those to me are like emojis because you can do a whole story text message in emojis and we used to do um cave paintings yeah um there's also a lot of really interesting history about that too and I asked they, um they did a research study again in around the late 2010s like 2015, um at Oxford and they found that a lot of the people who were leading a lot of um communities were people and like who were taking down the stories were a lot of people who were neurodivergent themselves so a lot of the original cave paintings emojis were by people who were neurodivergent leaders in their community because of how their brain was processing the information. Um, and I just thought that was interesting because that's, um, it's not a super well-known one, but it is a really fascinating bit of early history. Yeah. So what are some of the proudest achievements that you've guys had so far? What you like to share? Uh, for me, I think it's um, about getting open and forward, having a much bigger space than what we used to. Having more people coming through because like TF Green is literally a uh, stone throw away from us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hopefully you get a lot more people, a lot more business too. Yeah, I can't wait till also seeing more of my customers. Yeah, but yeah, it must be uh cool. Yeah, yeah, it must be. You must be kind of glad to be able to see, because you you had something small and be able to see the progression of your business yeah. and grow. So that it's, it's always exciting. Yeah. To see something that you started for something small and be able to grow. It keeps growing. I'm just laughing at myself because I can picture myself coming in there ordering a hot chocolate in the middle of May. Hey, I'll make it still. What about yeah. you, Chase? What are some achievements that you are proud of? I think one of the coolest was that I won a health equity award in 2020 for disability activism and disability rights. Um, and I think that was one of the coolest because I got I started doing a lot more work with medical systems after that on how to um, learn how to navigate it. And even even with all, even with, um, if you know how to navigate it, I still didn't even realize that I was dealing with more than just the ASD for another five years too. 
Um, so there's a lot of stuff that is really interesting. I think the other thing is, is that I'm learning how to, or trying to celebrate small things, um, rather than necessarily big things, because I think, uh, big things is very rooted in, uh, productivism in a way. And productivism is just, uh, how much you can accomplish. Um, and like what big goals versus small goals, like that comp, the competitive nature of not just business, but like, um, aging society, all of that. Um, and instead of giving into this like race where it's like, okay, everybody has to be at the same place by this time and like doing all this stuff, I'm trying to teach myself how to be okay with where I am and how to celebrate whatever it is that is a little victory, you know? And a lot of people in our community, they have a lot of little victories that aren't necessarily like, oh, I I won the award for this whole thing necessarily. And I think a lot of times we don't celebrate a lot of the smaller things the way we should, especially um, with folks who are who do have trouble with processing, um, where learning maybe one, two, three words a year and how to do it on the tablet uh, with Proloquo or any of the other AAC apps. Like, if that's an achievement, that's an achievement. And it's not less than anybody else's. Yeah, and those small those small wins tend to also keep keep you going to do even more small wins and maybe bigger wins too over time. Yeah. Help you be successful. Now that you guys are a business owner, have you noticed any changes in how people interact with you now versus back then? Yeah, I have. Yeah, like what? I'm more a part of my community than ever changed um it's changed me in a person because before like i didn't want anything to do with like anybody and now like i'm more a part of my community than i've ever been like like i have customers who are on law enforcement that come in um i have people our firefighters that come in. Yeah. Like I run into, I've ran into so many customers at the grocery shop, at like just anywhere, really. And they're like, oh, Michael, how have you been? Like I ran into one of my customers at Bass Pro one time. I was out with my mom and my dad, and we went to Bass Pro because I love. Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> it's like a second home to me, pretty much. And we were just walking around, um, and we ran into one of my customers. So, and they're like, oh, Michael, how are you? And it was just so nice, because, like, I don't, I before, I never had anything like that. Like, I've run into, like, old friends who have known me. But now at the coffee shop, I'm running into people everywhere. That come to my coffee shop, that are friends, like Tracy, for instance. Like, her and I went to Advocates in Action together. So, yeah. Yeah, it's always nice to see like, people outside of what you work with and interact with them. And uh, it's kind of like... um like a celebrity type of thing, right? Yeah, I'm basically the mayor of Rhode Island right now. <laughs> what about you, Tracy? Um, I'm still working on... Um, I've been working a lot online because of a lot of the stuff that I've been dealing with, not just with my ASD, but with my um, with my physical disability stuff as well. Um, so I've been really hesitant to go out since 2020 because of immunocompromised and all of that. Um, but I finally got answers, so I'm looking to actually do more stuff in person in the fall, so I haven't really had, like, a super 
good gauge yet, like in with in person stuff. Um, a lot of my gauge is through social media, but I'm also I also haven't like charged anybody for a lot of what I'm putting out there either because there's so much misinformation by people and they're not trying to be mean. They're people who mean really well. They just want people to have more access. But they are doing it in a way where it's only serving one part of the community rather than the community as a whole. Um, or it's half information. Um, yeah. So I think I'm kind of excited to look at transitioning from having a lot of that stuff that I did online to doing that more in person and then finding out like what a good balance is for both of those things. Now, Tracy, since you do a lot of stuff online, when you say something about a particular topic, do people tend to reject reject that or do they tend to like accept what you're saying? Um, it depends. It depends. I think most people are pretty accepting. I think the one thing that is hard is that there's a lot of people because there's not really tone. Um, and a lot of people struggle with understanding sometimes what's being said, especially by people who are in or who are already in or grew up in marginalized communities that do not have to do any kind of like reconnecting or, um, figuring out how to get involved with community. Um, cause a lot of the stuff that we say is, ta- is taken a lot as people will think of it as gatekeeping as like, Oh, we don't want you in the community. And that's not what we said. A lot of times it's, we want you to get to know the community before advocating for the community. Like if you are somebody who is new to the office community, get involved with local places. And I mean, ones that don't require diagnosis, but also like, See if there's other people that you can just hang out with that's not a formal social that are ASD. So that way you can get used to autistic spaces and the difference between um, that and a neurotypical space. But also get involved with developmentally disabled spaces, not just autism. Um, Because so much of our community isn't just autism. It's also people with Down syndrome. It's people with cerebral palsy. It's people who have all this whole variety of different things that they grew up with. And if you're only accessing this community from one of the states, you're going to miss a lot of the equity that has to be there for other folks in the community, especially folks who can be judged because they look different or they might need some help with like how to word things. And make it clear, um, if especially to people who aren't used to hearing people who have like different, not not accents, but like in the disabled community, like how people have different ways of talking based on what what their ability is or if they can at all. How does it make you feel that you've built something of your own? It makes me feel appreciated throughout my community. I think for me, it's kind of interesting. Because I was doing this not as a business thing before, like as a um advocacy thing. And, um, I think it's interesting to see how things have evolved from when I started advocating to now. Um, especially with a lot of the people who are now able to self diagnose and who recognize like what are things that go along with autism and what aren't. Um, I just wish that that energy would expand to actually getting to know people who have higher support needs. And I mean, people who are not the kind of autistic that you would uh, fetishize. People who have, who will say things that are not socially tolerable that you have to explain and help them understand instead of rejecting them from your community where you have to um, really get to know people and be okay with their quirks, be okay with things that they do that is a part of their diagnosis, which isn't always what you're used to. Sometimes it's people who they repeat the same thing. They have things that they like. There are some people 
I have friends who quote movies out of context, and I love that. Um, but a lot of people don't know what they're doing or don't know how to match the the what they're saying up with whatever movie they're quoting, so they can't really um, fully access this person's way of communicating. But getting to know the people who are considered higher support needs as well as the ones that are considered lower support needs because if we really want neurodiversity acceptance and autistic acceptance that's to go for the whole community you can't just be cherry picked who you decided was worth it very well, true so the last question i have for both of you why is the inclusion of individuals with disabilities important i'll have something to contribute there's a whole lot that goes into this, but I mean, I think especially for modern society and a lot of things that are shifting in modern society, like we talk about wanting to be more socially conscious. We talk about wanting a lot more access. All of these things are things that would need to center disabled people to really reach everybody. Um, and I think also really respecting the ideas of intelligence extremes too. Um, I'm somebody who is, uh, twice exceptional, which means I'm autistic, but I'm also, um, advanced in a few different areas in terms of intelligence, but that sets me up for some struggles that most people wouldn't think about. Um, because the word gifted is extremely eugenic and misleading, but also a lot of people don't know why sometimes the stuff that is a struggle for me might be a lot easier for folks who uh, struggle with a lot more of the intellectual like um, processing kind of stuff but are a lot better at like emotional regulation or a lot better at um, being themselves with without uh, worrying about who's judging you know what I mean and a lot of times we don't think about those things as strength, weaknesses, or forms of intelligence either. Um, so our metric of how we view talent and how we view intelligence is completely skewed. Because we're only judging it by books and we're not judging it by the the whole uh, spectrum of things that make up a person. That's an interesting point. Cool. And I've thought about that. So, Michael, where can people find more about you, about your coffee shop, the one on more? Our websites, Facebook, Instagram. Um, our website's Red, White, and Brew RI. Our Instagram is Red, White, Brew for You. Awesome. What about you, Tracy? If someone wants to learn more about where can they find you? Cool. Um, most of the stuff that I put up. I put up on TikTok. I put it up at TD Mad Genius. I haven't uploaded it at a, in a while. Um, and I have to. And then on most social handles, you can also look for Thinking Diversity. And you'll also, that'll be my company page. My actual handles are usually something along the lines of Tracy Lee Allard. Well, thank you both for being on today. Uh, I wish you luck in your businesses. Uh, if there's... Anything else you'd like to share with us? You can say it now. Yeah, I think thank you for having both of us, too, um, and hosting it. And also just in general being knowledgeable about all this stuff. This was a lot of fun, Nate. And thank you for having me. Yeah, it was fun. I even learned a lot of some stuff, too. This is the second time we're doing it this year, and I think it's definitely needed, too. So I'm, I'm excited to be part of that. <laughs>